children of Israel now. Uh, Balaam advised Balak. And I said, you see these people? You're not going to be able to get them, conquer them, overcome them. You're not going to be able to destroy them except the sea. And so Balaam said, I'm going to give you an advice. Let your women, let your ladies expose themselves unto the children of Israel. And then when they entice them, attract them into sin, into evil, something will happen. The children of Israel will commit sin. And once they commit sin, then God will forsake them. And the destruction you are looking for, very easy, once they sin. Look at it in verse 3. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his name, that they that were joined unto be Peor. Look at this in verse 6. And behold, one of the children of Israel, came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all Israel of the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation as many people were dying because of the adultery, the word on the fornication, the morality that had been committed then this other fellow bold can do anything. Brought it, medium tissue woman. Woman. He, this is the reason why many of the children of Israel were dying because of the judgment of God. And then we're told in verse 7. And when Phineas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand. You know, when the children of Israel, when they all saw that, it's like this fellow that brought the Midianitish woman, this fellow kind of coward everybody, made, made everybody a coward. Everybody was crying and weeping because of the sin that had just been committed. And many people were dying. And then this other fellow now coming bold and strong and bringing a woman and say, whatever happens, I'm going to do what I want to do anyway. And let Moses say what he wants to say. And let the Eliezer people say what they want to say. All of a sudden, something rose up in the heart of this man Phineas. And he took a javelin in his hand. Look at verse 8. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent. And he thrust both, the, both of them, the man and the woman, through. And the man of Israel, and the man of Israel, and the woman through with her belly. So the plague was taken from the children of Israel. And those that died in the plague were twenty and four thousand. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Look at verse 11 of Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned my wrath away. From the children of Israel, while he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consumed not the children of Israel in my jealousy. Wherefore say, Behold, I give unto him a covenant of peace, because he did what he did. Killing sin, destroying sin from the can, an action accounted. For eternity. That's what the Lord is telling us. Deal with sin in your personal life. That will be an action that comes for eternity. Deal with sin in the congregation of the people of God. That will be a ministry. An action that counts for eternity. Look at verse 13. And he shall have it. And you see after him. Even the covenant. Even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood. This was an action counting for eternity. This was a ministry counting for eternity. When you deal with sin in the congregation, any section of the congregation, and you purify the people of God and you purge the priesthood, then it says, because he was zealous for his God and made an atonement for the children of Israel. Phinehas, another man, Noah, 
Abraham, Moses, Phineas, men that count for eternity. I pray God will give us wisdom. That you'll never be a partner to sin or sinning. A partner to sinners. A partner to backsliders. Ex exalting them, promoting them, sustaining them, making them bold in their evil. It is when you fight against sin. It's when you arch against sin. Sin of any form, of any shape. That the Lord will say, that is an action. That counts for eternity. And makes you a man. And makes you a woman. Counting for eternity. Psalm 39. I'm reading from verse 4. Psalm 39 verse 4. Lord, make me to know mine age. And the measure of my days. What it is. That I may know how frail I am. You know, sometimes we think we're going to live to 70 when we might not. And sometimes we think we might not live to 70 when we might live up to 100. And you don't know tomorrow. And you don't know how frail life is, how short life is. Young people die, old people die, men die, women die. And the Lord is saying, Lord, give us wisdom that will count our days. Some of the people in the Bible, they knew when they were going to die. Some did not know. Paul the Apostle knew. That's why he told Timothy, I'm passing on something to you. A fought a good fight. I finished the race. Finished the course. Now there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. He knew when I was going to die. And Paul the Apostle, not only Paul the Apostle, Peter, also, he said, the Lord showed me. I'll soon put up this tabernacle. He knew when he was going to die. And because of that, he prepared. But the majority of the people in the world do not know when they are going to die. You may not know when you are going to die. That's the reason why the Lord is saying, pray. That the Lord will give you wisdom. Wisdom to live. That everything you do, the way you act, the way you live, and the work you do on the ministry you have in the church, and your ministry of evangelism also the church, you count the cost and count everything so that you have the wisdom to live and the Lord will grant you that life that will be rewardable in eternity in Jesus' name. Deuteronomy chapter 32, I'm reading from verse 29. Deuteronomy chapter 32, we're looking at verse 29. Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would have considered their latter end. Oh, that we are wise, and they will consider our latter end, so that whenever that end will come, whenever death will come, or whatever, whenever rapture will take place, that what we do will count for eternity in Jesus' name. These were men that counted for eternity. And the Lord is calling you to be one of them, to join them. Make sure you are born again, you are saved. And make sure you are sanctified without, because without holiness no man shall see the Lord. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see the Lord. Live the life of purity, the life of holiness, the life of sanctification that leads you to a life that will be rewardable in eternity. And then the Lord says, when the Lord says, come on home, then you are ready to go without any hesitation. Jeremiah chapter 33. Jeremiah 33, we're looking at verse 22. Men that count for eternity. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 22. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply the seed of David my servant, and the Levites that minister unto me. David was another man that counted for eternity. And you find the name of that man, David, everywhere in the New Testament and, Old, and the Old Testament, Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, the Lord is calling us to a life of wisdom, a ministry of wisdom, and an action, actions of wisdom, that everything we do, the way we live, will count for eternity. I pray you'll be the man, and you'll be the woman, the boy, the girl, that looks at everything he does and he says, I'm going to make my time count for eternity. Looks at Every day, I'm going to make each day count for eternity. Look at his ministry. I'm going to make my ministry count for eternity. Revelation chapter 21. 
verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. John the beloved saw heaven. But this something that he saw, look at verse 14. In verse 14, and the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The twelve apostles of the land of the Lamb, they had their names inscribed on the walls of New Jerusalem. And for eternity that those names will be there because those people labored for eternity. Now let's look at point number two matters that condemn for eternity. Matters that condemn for eternity. And you know there are people that they do not look at their steps or their actions or their words or their utterances. They do not look at their ministries and they do things and say things that will condemn them for all eternity except they repent. Let's look at First Kings chapter 12. First Kings chapter 12. We're looking at it from verse 26. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. God had restored Jeroboam, had given him ten tribes out of twelve. And he gave Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, only two tribes. And instead of Jeroboam being grateful for the opportunity and the privilege, he began to think in his heart, What I got from God by his mercy. How can I keep it by maneuvering? What I got by mercy. How can I keep it by manipulation? That's what happened to Jeroboam. Look at it again in verse 26. And Jeroboam said in his heart, that's what he said. Manipulation is going to come in and maneuvering is going to come in now. It says, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If these people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the, shall the heart of these people turn again unto the Lord, even unto their Lord, even unto the Rehoboam, the king of Judah. And they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, the king of Judah. Then, manipulation, look at this, wherefore, whereupon the king took counsel. And made two calves of gold, and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold, thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel, and the other put he in Dan. And this thing became a sin. For the people went to worship before the one even unto Dan. Jeroboam made the whole nation to sin because he wanted to preserve his position. He wanted to preserve the people unto himself. And he said, I'm going to do something so that the minds of the people will stay with me. So that all these people, none of them, will leave me. Do you ever think of that? Something to do? So that people will not focus on Christ, but focus on you. Do you sometimes do that? We're talking about evangelism. And we're talking about scattering abroad and going everywhere. And do you think in your mind, Ah, if these people scatter like that, and then some go to plant churches there, some go to plant churches there. My friends that will be together in this local, local section of the ministry, they will be separated. I cannot imagine that. Before that happens, let's have some manipulation. Let's some, have some maneuvering so that we we'll set this up and set this up so that the scattering, the preaching, the evangelism, 
and the planting churches here and there so that that will not take place. That's what he did. But do you know, that action was an action that condemned him for all eternity. I'm, I'm going to look. Remember the name? What's the name of that man again? Tell me out loud. Tell me for sure. Let's look at him. This first king, chapter 14, verse 15a. Chapter 14, verse 15. Look at verse 15. For the Lord shall smite Israel. Why? Look at verse 16. And he shall give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam, who did sin and who made Israel to sin. He sinned on his own and he made Israel to sin. Because of his maneuvering and because of the manipulation, don't go to Jerusalem to worship. That's too much for you. I'm thinking about your ease and your pleasure. I'm thinking about your convenience. If you go out there, that journey is too long for you. And all you wanted is to keep the people in square one, where they, were, where they had been in the past. And the Lord is saying, why do you do this? I gave you this position, opportunity, as a gift. You didn't merit it. You had run away. When Solomon wanted to kill you, I brought you back and gave you 10 out of 12 tribes. Why do we have to maneuver anything or manipulate anything? Why don't we just say God gave it to me? If God wants me to have it, he'll keep it with me. But Jeroboam did not do that and God said, I'm going to even cast Israel away because of the sin of Jeroboam who sinned by himself and he made Israel to sin. Look at chapter 15 verse 26. Chapter 15, verse 26, the matters that condemn for all eternity. Chapter 15, verse 26, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord, and he walked in the way of his father, and in the sin which he made Israel to sin. You see the repetition of that again? It went from generation to generation. And uh, we have said the sin of a leader is a leading sin. The sin of a person that rules over other people is a ruling sin. And the sin that you commit in the public is like you transfer that sin into the hands of other people to sin. And it goes from generation to generation. And it is a matter that condemns for all eternity. I'm looking at chapter 15, verse 30. Look at verse 30. Look at what it says. First King, chapter 15, verse 30. Yeah, it tells us, because of the sins of Jeroboam, which is sin, and which he made his 